Lord that's giving praise tonight. Good to see y'all love you. Thank you guys for coming to turn and eat and hug around for Bible study. We certainly appreciate that. And those of you who couldn't make it, I know you pray at home. And that's that's good too. That's good too. Our prayers are being answered. Uh, we're praying <clears throat> that we would be effective in winning the loss. And we have a guy that came to the Lord Sunday morning. So that worked. And then we've been praying that God would send us people to minister to. And that happened today. Had to get a little guy a bus ticket. Car broke down. Had to get to Bristol. And he showed up at our door. And the Lord said, there you go. So we got him fixed up. and got him. Now we're, we know that he's going to continue to send people for us to minister to. And he's going to raise some of you up to minister to those who are going to come. So get ready. <laughs> hey, there are gifts that you have that I know, that I know he can, he can use. We're going to get started with our uh, prayer request here. We, we pray for these in the, in the prayer meeting. Remember James Bolash? He will be going for surgery on June the 7th, have a spot uh, removed from his left lung. So let's pray for James. Remember Denise Russell? She goes in on the 6th to have a uh, a surgery on her thyroid gland. Uh, they're not going to remove it. It has something to do with, <clears throat> uh, I don't know, she tried to explain it to me, but anyhow, just remember, remember D. Remember Billy Joe's friend, uh, Ken Wanda, was in a wreck, and we want to keep him in prayer that, that he would be all right. Uh, Rachel Sharon's uh, brother Jack, Brought up the request for Rachel. Uh, let's remember her in prayer. Uh, Ray Sharp, who was on the prayer list last week, I haven't heard from him or about him. So keep praying for Brother Ray Sharp, if you would. And Ashlyn Duncan, uh, Randall's grandchild. Ashlyn will be having her surgery on June the 28th at St. Mary's in Richmond. And hopefully what they will be able to do with Ash is she'll be able to walk there uh, once they get that surgery done. So that's what we're praying for, for Miss Ash. I want to say little Ashley. She's not little anymore. She's a nice young lady that I remember as, as being kids here. Have you got requests up with the hand? Maybe, maybe that you want to mention? Who wants to add in? Yeah, brother. Mike, I'd like to remember Becky. She, she is going through some health issues, I'm not sure what, but she needs our prayers. Becky. Thatcher. 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 Okay. Let's remember Becky. Somebody else? I remember Becky Smith, I, I raised Christmas with her before she had cancer. Well, she's had her chemo and she goes tomorrow to get the results of her scan to see what cancer is going. All right. And, and tell me your name again. Becky Smith. Becky Smith. Becky. Oh, well, yes. It's, it's Becky. Becky Smith. Becky Smith. She does chemo. Yes, <laughs> Good thing I'm not the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember James Gravely? James Gravely. He, he has that uh, diabetes, you know, that type one. And it's he's missed some at school. Of course, he's going to fail. Oh, no. Can't get it under control. He goes up. Then he's in the hospital. He just got out of the hospital Sunday morning. Oh my goodness! So that's rough stuff. It is rough for <clears> him. <throat> that he is. How, how old is he? 14. Wow. Juvenile diabetes. Yeah, that's what Alicia Davidson uh, started out with. Alicia, it was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. It's, it's, it's rough stuff. We just need to pray for James. Somebody else. <clears throat> Let's continue to pray for Richard Collins. He fell and broke his hip. Richard Collins? Oh, Pastor Richard. He's, he's at home. He had surgery. He's home doing good. Okay. Goodness. All right, 
Sister Iris. Uh, Robbie and Renee Beaver. Robbie. Karen Beaver. Yeah, Rob Steele hospitalized out there. Robbie Beaver. Somebody else. I'm glad God remembers who they all are, don't you? Knows every one of them by name. Knows what the need is. Let's all go to God in prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we come to you tonight on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord who told us to bring these burdens up to you. That's what we're doing. Coming together as a family of believers. First of all, thanking you for all that you've done for us, all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. As we call out each one of these that I have put down on the list here, I realize that I've put the hand under others. Many, there are many out there who are watching you. who need a touch from you, who need a special touch. I pray to my God, join with my brothers and sisters here tonight and just invoke your presence into these situations. Just touch and heal and mend and minister and comfort and all those things that you do. So, Lord, we ask you tonight on behalf of these folks who aren't able to be here, but Father, we lift them up to you, for there's no distance in prayer. We pray here and you answer there. So, we believe in that tonight. So, be with them, we ask. Now, Lord, bless these who are here. Thank you that they had the opportunity to come out and be with us. And thank you for those who are tuned in on Facebook. We love you, Lord, for all you do for us. Your wonderful name, Jesus, we ask all these things and give all of this thanks in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Brother Randall, we're going to begin worship as we give. Thank you, Jesus. Finally, give me a place in another garden. I do the flat move on my roof. The rise is dead. The apple is down. I know. My teeth are the best. Christ for bread and cry. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Randall. Thank you for feeling. Brother Robin, Sister Dan. Good evening. We're going to sing 155, 155, 14 to the life. Stand to your anchor. 155. Wonderful words.
Love those songs. Good songs. Like the new stuff. <clears throat> I really like those hymns, man. A lot of good theology in those things takes us right back. Oh, goodness. Well, <clears throat> week number 13, we're starting chapter 5, and we're going to look at the first 14 verses of that chapter. The Apostle Paul is continuing uh, in his letter to the Ephesians, and uh, I guess a good way to put it is putting the responsibility on the believer as being a part of the church. Uh, that we have a responsibility as representatives of Christ. So that's what the church is made up of, is individual believers. So if you turn to chapter 5, we'll look at the first 14 verses. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these words. He said to the Ephesians, Therefore, in, in other words, everything I've already told you, be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator or unclean person, nor a covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, so therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. And then in parenthesis, he says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed or made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. So therefore, he says... The Lord is written in Isaiah, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Paul is continuing to paint his picture or to draw a parallel between uh, the, the society in which they, they live and the people in that society and coming out of that society that Christ had brought them out of, how that now the type of people they should be or, or can be. Father, we thank you that we have this opportunity again to study this word. We realize that that Ephesian culture was, was just as bad as ours. So I pray now that you just help us as we look into this letter that Paul not only wrote to them, but it's as real for us today as it was for them in that century. So help us, Holy Spirit, to see that which we need to see, to draw us closer to you, to make us better disciples, and to be better evangelists. And we'll thank you for it, Jesus. In your wonderful name I pray. And all the saints will say, we love you, Lord. Amen and amen. All right, I'll try to stick on our note here. Over the paragraph, we saw last week that Christians are expected to have a change of lifestyle in regards to unbelievers. Now, the Holy Spirit dwells in believers. And when we allow Him to have His way in us, then we differ from those whom He does not dwell in. So this week, in this, this passage, 
The apostle focuses on three areas in which society seems to have the most trouble. Sexual immorality, uncleanliness, and covetousness. So we're going to try to look at this in narrative form as opposed to going through the theological aspect of it or trying to explain why this is sin. We're just going to talk about the fact that the apostle wants him to understand what Christ has done for him, what, what he has delivered him from. So we start with the first two verses. <clears throat> Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Paul says that children uh, should imitate their parents. Uh, you, you know, depending on what they learn, they, they should. Uh, we, we know we, it depends on what you pour into them or how you teach them or whatever, but you, you'd be surprised, you know, what, what children learn from us as parents. Uh, you know, I think once we... Once we as parents learn how to parent our children to grow. So then we get to tell them how to parent their children. That's for you, Josh. That's what we generally try to do. But that, that's pretty much what Paul was trying to get them to understand is children of God, we should imitate him. Now you gotta be careful with that word. He's not he's not talking about hypocrites. Uh, you know, one of the things you hear a lot of times. Well, you're a Christian, you need to act like it. Well, don't act. <laughs> act is a word for hypocrisy. Don't act like you're a Christian. Be a Christian. Yeah. Be a Christian. That, that's that we, you know, we say things, I, I guess, we know what we mean. But anyway, in verses 1 and 2, he said, walk in love. How many know it's always hard to love everybody? Now, Pastor Don told me one time he went to South Carolina. His dad pastored the church there. And he went down to, to speak at his dad's church. And he said when, when the congregation was leaving, they were at the back door. And he said this fellow came up and spoke to his dad and he said something. And then he came to him and he said, you know, he said, I don't think your dad likes me very much. And Jim said his dad chimed in and said, no, you got that wrong, brother. I don't like you a lot. <laughs> it's not just a little bit. <laughs> I don't like you a lot. <laughs> well, we can, we can relate, but, but it's a fact when, when, he, when he tells us to walk in love, this is how he, he says we're to do it. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Now that comes from Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. If you look at that, if you look at that verse, this is where Paul gets that from. That Paul was the shark in dealing with sacrifices. He was a rabbi. He knew the law upside down and backwards. <clears throat> but if you look at Genesis 8 and 20. This is when Noah came out of the ark and he built an altar to the Lord and he took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. This was immediately after, his, after the water had dried up. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So that was a that was a promise. And what did he put in the sky to validate that? Right, 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 right. Yeah. Isn't that slick? You looked at a rainbow, you just remember that thing was around in the beginning. I don't know, look out of that art. It's all that rainbow. That's awesome stuff. But anyway, Paul is, is telling him, because we have been saved by his sacrifice, then the love that he has shown us, we should reflect to others. Now, it's not 
our love, but it is his love. And that's what Paul means when he says we are to walk in love. It, it just simply says that we are to see other humans as being created by him. And that, that's, it, you know, it's it still, it still just, when, when you talk about loving everybody, you know, it, it's, it's hard to find love for somebody that goes into a school that kills children. Uh, I mean, just up front, it's hard to find love for somebody like that. But what Paul wants us to understand is that soul is still worthy of salvation. Now, I mean, Christ still died for that person. That, that, that doesn't excuse the, the person because they did a bad thing or, or because they were a bad person. But he tells us to remember. I, I think I've heard it said this way. That by the grace of God, there they lie. You ever read that said that? Yeah. What's that mean? None of us. Have any idea? <laughs> yeah, that, that's about the way it is. I, I think what it what it means is the fact every one of us are capable of doing atrocious things. We're, we're capable. We have we have the ability. We have the means. We we could actually do it if we if we wanted to do it. The fact we don't want to do it is because God's grace upon us is strong enough that we don't have that desire. When I used to teach stress management, uh, well, may have been you, one, one guy told me the definition. He said, I, I know what the definition of stress is. <sighs> Factory full of guys, you can imagine, watch out. I said, all right, what is the definition of stress? He said, that's when you want to choke the life out of somebody, but you know they're putting you in jail if you do. <laughs> been there. <laughs> yeah, been there. You have to consider repercussions. So walking, walking in love is, is what Paul says to see other humans as being created by God. Because Paul is just simply telling the Ephesians, you are really no better than they are as far as humanism goes. But God has called you out and he has saved you. But that same sacrifice that saved us, it's the same sacrifice that will save them. Uh, and, and it can save them. So it, it helps us <clears throat> in the sense that I, I see a Facebook post and I'll, I don't guess we want to tell God this that I saw on Facebook. It's not my circus and it's not my monkeys. And I guess that's true. But it is God's service. I mean, he owns it all, and he controls it all, and we are his monkeys. I mean, but he created all of us. So it's in a sense that even though, even though there may be, there may be those it's hard to love, he loves them. He loves them. He does. And that's why that love has to come through us, by him, to them, but because as far as what we're able to do on our own, we're just not able to do it. Now, verses 3 through 12, all these are actually one passage, and they're dealing with the depravity of the human nature in regards to choosing unrighteousness over righteousness. And Paul is, is saying, that these who are unsaved are giving place to the sinful nature of humanity. Sin comes natural, like it or not. It, it's, part of being, it's part of being human. Uh, it, it started with Adam and Eve, but it hasn't changed. The human nature will never change. The ways and means may change, but the nature of the human creature will never change. Uh, I heard Joel Olstein say, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to call you out, buddy. I heard Joel Olstein say that 99.5% of people are good. 
No, they're not, Joel. Nobody's good. No. Paul said in the book of Romans, there is none good. No, no. not one. Amen. There's no good in any of us. In, in, in 100% of the people, there is none good. So there can't be 99.5. It's a good thought. You like to think whether they're good people. There are no good people. Jesus himself said to the guy that came to him and said, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Remember what Jesus said to him? Why do you call me good? Yeah. Well, you're the Lord. But he was, he was saying, there's, there's not but one that's good. And that's God. But, you know, man, there's no goodness in, in man. So the sinful nature of humanity is what Paul is, is pointing out to them. And, and I think, now this is me, uh, I think he was trying to, to get them to understand that because Christ had saved them and, and had called them out, if you want to say called them out uh, of the world, per se, in a sense, spiritually, that it did not mean that they would be in sinless perfection. Uh, I think I think that's where a lot of cults begin begin from. Uh, for for some reason, I, I think that Satan has has tried to make people believe that once you come to Christ, if you are really a Christian, then you're going to be perfect. Uh, I think he tries to to get that across to people, and then of course, knowing that we're not perfect. And just as soon as something happens or we do something or say something or take something or whatever it is, I think it rolls up. See, I told you, you, you can't be good enough. You're, you know, you're just not. Well, Billy Graham said we'd never be good enough. Uh, he said no matter how good we are, we will never be good enough. And that's why Christ came. But I think Paul wants them to understand we're not talking about sinless perfection. But we're not going to the other side of the issue either, saying that sin doesn't matter. Uh, I think he wants them to understand that there is a natural side uh, of the human depravity, but what Christ does for us is supernatural. The word supernatural means above natural. And that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. So the one who is head saved who intellectually believes what the Bible has to say but has never been born again then that person doesn't have the ability to overcome the sinful human nature. It's, it's that. It's something that you can't, you can't overcome it by willpower. You, you, you just can't. It's just not going to happen. But he wanted to understand that with Christ, <clears throat> then there was a change that comes into their lives, and they're able to see the difference once they, once they come to it. In verse 4, he says, <clears throat> he starts his list, but in verse 4 he said, neither filthiness, well, let's, let's just go to 3, he said, but fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints. Saints should be part of that. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of things. Now, in looking at this passage as a whole, Filthiness, the, the word used here, filthiness, the Greek word it comes from means a lack of moral character. Moral character. You know, people today believe that morals are fashioned by society. What, what may be immoral in one society is okay in another society. I had a missionary tell me one, one time, we were at camp meeting, and it was his first time to one of these 
outback villages in, in it may have been Africa, or I'm not sure, but he said the first meeting that he had, all the women showed up topless to the meeting. And he said, you can imagine how I felt, you know, how it was. And he said, I, I told the interpreter, I told the guy, he said, I can't, can't, they can't come like this. I, I can't have that. He said, in this culture, it, it, it is the prostitutes that cover up. It, it, you know, it's the harlots that, that wear the tops. So he said, that's why this is, this is natural because they have children, they nurse children. They, see, they didn't see it from the perspective. He, he saw it as a sexual thing. They saw it as a natural thing. Uh, I mean, you know, to them. So the harlot would be covered up, meaning well, she didn't have children, she was a harlot. That's what she did. So he said, it was hard to learn that, you know, a lesson like that, but, but generally you understand that. So that, that's not saying it, it's immoral for them to be that way. But the lack of a moral character is not dependent upon the society, but it's dependent upon God. And it's dependent upon his word. He told Peter, he said, you be holy because I'm holy. And, and holy is separated, set apart. Well, those women were separated. They were set apart from the other women. But <clears throat> filthiness means lack of moral character or principles. When he says that there should be no foolish talk. Now, you got, you got to keep this in perspective. One of, one of the worst things, I guess I could say worst things, that we do with Scripture sometimes is we tend to take a verse or two and, and apply it to a situation and don't look at the whole context he's talking about. This whole context that he's talking about, this whole human depravity, that's fallen into sin. All this is in is in one group here. And he says, when there should be no foolish talking or coarse jesting, he said, you shouldn't joke about sin. Sin's nothing to be liked. It, it's nothing to be joked about. It, he said, you know, in, in this society, when you're talking about the immoral characters, you, you shouldn't joke about the fact because it's a sad thing. It, it's a sad thing that, that it's, it's that way. And there should be no coarse jesting. Do you know what jesting, the word jesting means? The word jesting means you don't take what someone says seriously. That's what it means. And he said, you should not make a joke of sin and you should not say things about sin that cannot be taken seriously because sin's not a joking matter. Facebook is full of that stuff, guys. Uh, I mean, people sin, they make fun of them. They, they do. They, they make fun of them. And, you, you know, it's, that's not befitting for the Christian. And, and I see Christians that do that. And, and I know that they, what's all in good fun? It's not fun. You know, sin's not fun. And if people see that, you think, well, this is, no, it, it has a bearing on those who are unbelievers uh, as to how they interpret what, you know, what you interpret or how you see things. So Paul tells them this fornication and this uncleanliness and this covetousness and this filthiness. Don't, don't joke about it. It's not fitting. But he says, rather give thanks. What do you give thanks for? The grace that is in God for forgiveness. The thanks is to God for the forgiveness. That's where the thanks comes into play. <clears throat> you, you thank him that, that people can be forgiven for that. <laughs> Paul himself said, you know, he sinned out of ignorance one time. But when the law was given, 
he realized he wasn't ignorant anymore of sin. He knew that's what it was. So <clears throat> Paul says instead of joking about sin and not taking it seriously, give thanks to God that he has forgiven us. Give thanks to him that people can be forgiven. See, it ties back into that sacrifice. He didn't just say that about Christ being sacrificed and said, forget it. All that, all that ties into this stuff. It all tied Christ died for all this stuff. And he's telling them, you, you can't just laugh at all. Uh, when I was in the psychology classes, one of the professors said, the funny thing about us humans, the way we do, we tend to joke about things we're uncomfortable with. Things that we can't handle, we try to make a joke out of it. Because for some reason, it seems a little easier to handle them. I guess that's human nature. Well, that's what Paul's saying. Now, when he talks about fornication here, the word fornication sums up all illicit sexual behavior. There is a word that is used for fornication, which is sex outside of marriage. But this word fornication takes in that plus adultery and everything else that is sexually immoral. The word sums up all illicit sexual behavior. He didn't go into detail name for name. And, and this will probably <clears throat> give you some insight. The Greek word, not work, is your note got work? <laughs> the Greek word. <laughs> I got a K on my letter. But maybe I ain't got that on your notes. Okay. <clears throat> the Greek word for the fornication is pornea. P-O-R-N-E-I-A. Anybody want to guess what word we get from that? Wow. Yeah. That's that's where it where it comes from. That that's where the word pornography came out of. Uh, was the Greek word they picked it up through, through the English and used it as illicit sexual behavior is how it, it came into play. That is the biggest threat for our society today. It, it's a threat to us, it's a threat to our children, it's a threat to families. Satan is, is using that to divide and conquer. He, he is using that, and, and especially today, you know, there, there were days, I probably told you the story of eight, I'll confess, when, when I was 12, uh, I think I've told you this story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told you. Yeah. When I was 12, our neighbors were good neighbors. We were a good bunch of folks. But uh, the, the guy's dad got a subscription to play for the night. Well, I don't have to tell you what Playboy magazine was back in the 60s. And probably still out there, I don't know. But anyhow, uh, he let me borrow it. He let me borrow the magazine, you know. He knows what I'm talking about. And buddy, I thought I was great. Talking about a 12-year-old boy, testosterone coming out your meters already, you know. And, and I, I tuck it in, into my room, and, and I sit on the bed, I'm flipping through that. And Dad walked in. The lady minister walked right in the room, busting. No use to try to hide. And but I did, you know. What you got? Oh, whoa. Oh. Well, this is all I got. So he said, Well, sit down there. Been been better if he had just took it and wore me out and sent me to bed without supper. But he said, sit down there. <clears throat> and made me go through it with him. Page. Page. I was kind of like Barney. I mean, he grew up with Eddie Fail. He is in the trash dump. He didn't want to get articles in there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we went through that. And just as soon as we got through it, I was lower than a snake's belly. I mean, there was just no recourse. And he closed it, and he took it, and he said, now you know what naked ladies look like. And for some reason, 
it took the wind out of my sails. It just, well, I thought it was something, you know, <clears throat> but it didn't move me to be a doctor. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I, I knew, I knew at that point, here, here, here's the lesson, here's the lesson all of it. It didn't dramatically damage me mentally. I, I mean, that, that incident. But the way he handled that, you know, he, he didn't deny it. He, he's a lay minister. He didn't beat me over the head and he didn't say, you know, you're because that would have sent me looking, well, if it's that bad, there's got to be something good at it. It was a simple fact that, yeah, this is reality. This is what it is. This is how it, it, it's put together. But what ha what's happening today is this, this illicit sexual behavior is at the fingertips of everybody that carries the problem, regardless of how old they are or what age you are. There are no stops, there are no barriers. There is nothing to stop it from happening. And what it does, what it does, is it breaks down the human morality. And it takes, it takes the natural part out of it and somehow makes it supernatural towards, towards the creature. And psychologists have, have proven, it's a proven fact that it is addictive, that it is very addictive, which is exactly what Paul talks about here, because he attaches uncleanliness to covetousness. And he brings in the word there in verse five, <clears throat> a fornicator, an unclean person, a fornicator is an unclean person, nor a covetous man, and they do covet because they are an idolater. Covetousness is just not wanting all material things. Covetousness is simply, I, I got it down here in your, in your other notes on down through there, I'll get there in a minute. But covetousness is not just for material things. On your note, uncleanliness is a lifestyle. When he talks about uncleanliness, it's a lifestyle. It is not something that the person can wash off or lay down or move away from. It is a lifestyle of uncleanliness because it is tied to filthiness, which is a lack of moral character. Uncleanliness is a sin disease. It, it is natural, and it was brought into the human race naturally. And therefore, sin is a disease of the human race. And, and that's why when Christ died, when he heals our, he forgives our iniquities and heals all our diseases. Healing is an important part of the soul as much as it is for the physical body. And Jesus healed physically for the very reason that he, that he told the Pharisees that day, they let the man down through the roof on the, on the mat, remember that, and they cut a hole. And he told him to take up his bed and walk, and he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. Because they believed that he was in a condition because he had sinned, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you because he came to Christ. And the Pharisees said, who is this who forgives sins? He blasphemes. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, so that you may know that the Son has power on earth to forgive sins, which is easier to say, take up this mat and walk, or your sins are forgiven you. And of course the answer is, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, because you can't see that. If he said your sins are forgiven, well, he wouldn't know if they was or not. So, you know, there's no way they could know if his sin was forgiven or not. But when he says, so that you may know that I have power to forgive sins, Take up your man and walk. So he simply said to him, if I can do this which you can see, I can do that which you don't see. That's the power I have. So the sexual immorality leads to an unclean lifestyle, and we know that many physical diseases come from such behavior. 
it's just a, it's just a, so, but that's just, <clears throat> that seems to be the, the foremost of society. Uh, as the old saying used to say years ago, still true today, sex saves. And, and that's how it, that's how it's marketed. That's how things are put forth. And it, it takes out the true part of it, that God has intended to be a good thing, has been perverted and misused. That's why he told the Romans that they had been given over to a debased or a perverted mind to do the things which were not natural. Sex was a natural thing. God, God made it to be natural, to, to multiply the race. But it was in a particular context that it was to be used. It, it wasn't intended as entertainment. It wasn't intended as, as to what it is today. But what it does, it divides. It, it takes the intimacy out of relationships. It, it's where the people are looked at as as just say creatures and, and not actually human beings. And if you <clears throat> if you look at people in, that are caught up into it, it it's it's astounding. Uh, statistics say over 88 billion people a year uh, buy, buy into it through look through the internet or and it, and it's done the sex trafficking. How many's heard about that? All, all that all that stuff ties in. They they kidnap these people that uh, don't know what they're doing. They throw them into these scenes and and they make these movies. So and it's all about the money issue that people make off of. So our society was no different than that society. The only thing is we had more access today than they did, and that's why I said it's such a threat to this society. And he's going to talk about how to deal with that here in just a second. Anyway, it leads to covetousness. And covetousness <clears throat> is, I'm going to see if I have the definition on here for that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay. It leads to covetousness, and in this case, it's not the materialistic covetousness. It's, it is in context with the fornication and the unemployment. All this has got to go together. An unclean person, a sexually illicit person, this, this driven person is covetous. And that word means, covetous means wanting more. That's what covetous is. Covetous is wanting more. We could say it's never getting enough and never being satisfied. And that's why psychologists all the pornography in the picture. <clears throat> it is because it just gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, it, it comes to a point that uh, if, if a person wants more, they're, they're not going to get everything they want electronically, and it can move them in, into other areas. It can move them into, into rape. It can move them in, into murder. It just, they just want more <coughs> and more more. And he says it's covetousness. And that's why he dropped this word in here. He didn't drop it. He put it in here on purpose. He said there are a covetous man who is an idolater. And that's what he told the Romans. He didn't use the word idolater. What he said to the Romans was that they worship the creature instead of the creator. And, and the worship is turned to the creature as opposed to the one who made it. The creature. And, and they begin to idolize that. They begin to idolize that, that part of their lifestyle. See, see why it's hard for sexually immoral people when, when they say, I'm a Christian. It, it's, hard, it's hard to see that when, when you see what Paul says is happens and how it takes place. <clears throat> and, and he was telling them to be careful with that because this is what they were looking at. The, the fornication, the unemployment, the filthiness, the covetousness which leads to idolatry. 
We, we don't want an idol in this. What's an idol? Anything you worship. But how do you know what you worship? What do you talk about when we're reading that? Is she? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't catch it now. I can't talk about it. Worship, worship is what you put first in foremost. That, that's why worship is not a style. It, it's not, it's not a, a program. Worship is who you pay homage to. Who, who you pay. That's why Jesus kept saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah. Keep my commandments if you love, oh, I love you, Lord. And he said, yeah, well, if you love me, then why don't you do what I say? That's what he told one bunch. He says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And, and that's why I say it's a head thing versus a heart thing. So Paul's warning them to understand that. Here's how he breaks it down for them in verses 13 and 14. He tells them, don't be partakers with those, but it stones it. <clears throat> in 13 and 14, he goes on down through there on one of those other ones. He, he touches just a moment in verse 9 on the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is goodness and righteousness and truth. And he said, walk as children of light, because you were once in darkness. You once were dark. And he says in 13, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light so that for whatever makes it manifest is light. Whatever comes in the open is lit. It's light. So therefore he said, the prophet wrote, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And his light is true light. He will give you the true light. Uh, darkness and light are always, always compared in Scripture to being saved and unsaved. Darkness and light always identifies the children of God versus the children of Satan. The kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. Because there's, there's no comparison to that. You cannot have dark and light at the same time. It, it's impossible to do. You, you, you can't have a dark room and a light in it <laughs> and say you got light and dark. It, you can't, they don't mix. You, you, can't, you can't do it. it. It's impossible to have dark and light in the same place. So Paul says, you were once in darkness. We were all spiritually blind before we come to Christ, whether we realize it or not. We, we thought we knew the right way. We thought we were okay. We thought we knew what we needed to do. But it was only when the Holy Spirit came in <clears throat> that he began to show us things that probably we hadn't thought about. Some of the things we may have been thinking wrong about, some of the things we probably maybe not even thought about. But it was him who made that difference and showed us that difference. That's why Paul said in Corinthians, the natural man, the person who is unsaved, cannot discern spiritual things. You, you know, the person who is not saved cannot see anything spiritually wrong with some of the sexual, illicit sexual behavior. They don't see anything wrong with that. And, and you think, well, they're lying. They, no, they really don't see anything wrong with that because they are blinded to the problem. They're blinded to the truth. And we can talk to we're blue in the face, and it's not going to reach that part in their heart where the blindness is. Only Christ can do that. He, he's the only one that can get in there. That, that's why I say we can condemn people. But in order for them to be saved, he has to convict them. And, and they have to feel that conviction. They have to feel like that they need to be saved. They have to feel like they, they want another way of life. They, they have to want that. Because see, if you don't, <clears throat> it's not going to be 
translated, as Paul would say, it, from darkness into light. So dark and light always compares the same to the unsaved. Jesus said that men love darkness rather than light. They do. That's why the world is more dark than it is light. That's why there's more evil in the world than anything good is. Well, there's goodness in the world. I thank God that there is. If there wasn't some goodness in the world, they wouldn't be in hospitals. People wouldn't care about other people. Uh, I mean, they, they would just live their own life and, you know, if you're sick, you die. No, I don't care. You live or die. But people do care. So there's some goodness. But the only goodness that there is comes from God. It comes from Him. He's the one that, that puts it here. But there's a day coming that there won't be any goodness here. Because he who now restrains will one day be taken out when the church, when that remnant of good is gone, it will literally be hell on earth for those who are left behind. And, and that, that's just what the tribulation is, is really about. The unsaved are spiritually blinded. They're spiritually blinded. We were. We may not thought we were, but we were. I was an unsaved believer. I believed what, what they had thought. I believed what the Bible had to say. I believed in, in Jesus. I, I believed all that stuff, but not to the point that I felt like it was for me. You know, I, I believe that, but it wasn't. I mean, it, it's okay for the church people. You know, they're church people. They're the ones, you know, that, oh, I believe all that. It's good for the church people. The living second Corinthians, to turn to that, <clears throat> second Corinthians chapter four. I think it's where I found it. Yeah. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses three and four. And we're talking about the unsaved being spiritually blind. Paul said to the Corinthians, but even if our gospel is veiled, even if the gospel is hidden, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Why is it veiled? Why can't they see it, Paul? Whose minds, the little g, the God of this age, and Satan, the God of this age has blinded whose minds the God of this age has blinded. He's done that. Who do not believe, or if they believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on him. My prayer for those who are lost, Lord, penetrate that darkness. Penetrate that blinded mind and shine your light into their heart so that if they reject you, they will have to know who it is they reject you. Uh, they won't be guessing about it, but they will know who it is that they're rejected. Uh, I'm sure the little old man thought about that. He said, my mom told me, if you get in trouble, look for a church. Because you're probably going to find godly people at a church. <laughs> There's a good possibility you are. That, that's going to happen. So he was in trouble, and he looked. Now, God will bring it, he'll bring it back to his remembrance. And his mom will be able to, She'll take off on that, won't she? I told you. I'll tell what mom would do. I told you. You find the church in the end. You know that was going to happen. You know that. None of that is coincidence. It wasn't coincidence that I was here at the same time you was. It's not coincidence. It, it just doesn't happen that way. It's all orchestrated. So Paul was telling the Ephesians, and he zeroes mainly on the sexual immorality of the society because that's that's where the big danger takes place. Well, there, there's a lot more to that, but the danger 
in that, like I said, has to do with the with, with the fellowship. And, and it has to do with the morality of the society and the, and the characteristics set forth out of that society. And, and like the guy said in the pastor meeting at conference, he said, I think the church is, is struggling now to deal with all those things because for years we just didn't deal with those things. We, we, they were out there, but we didn't care. That hurt because it wasn't a part of our problem. I mean, we, now they're coming to the church. Now the church is forced to deal with it. Now the church is forced to deal with these issues. I guess we were to take advice from Marty Five. Nip it! God believes in bud nipping. <laughs> Nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud. So it, it starts, it starts with the children. I'm, I'm sharing with Ed what Hannah's going to be doing with, with her job. She's reaching out to at-risk at kids in middle school so that they can get them situated so that they will see that school is important and education is important. And they can get them to understand education with the goal of eventually maybe coming to the college. And, and you think, well, that's a marketing ploy. No, you got to start that. College recruitment used to start in high school. You see it here. Now it's got to start in middle school. Because by the time those kids hit high school, they're wrong. Their minds are made up, their decisions are made, they're making their own way. They're doing what they think they're going to do. So you have to find that pool that's right there in that window of opportunity that you can set straight why you have the opportunity to set them straight. Because at some point, it's going to be too late to get that opportunity. Not that they are going to come around. Sure, you're always going to have exceptions and rules. But you think of the brilliant minds. Think of the preachers. Think of the teachers. Think, think of all that's out there. If someone had just stepped in at a particular point and said, no, honey, life is really not what you think it is. And everybody don't have two moms. Everybody don't have two dads. Every, everybody don't just have a single pair. Oh, everybody don't just have to fend for their own selves to find food or to find shelter. Or you're not a not all, you know. Everybody, they're, they're bullied. You know, the cyber bullying, they're bullied, they're committing suicide, and somebody's got to get in there quick. And I thank God she's going to be one of them. It's going to be good now. Because you don't start with that. It's going to be tough. Questions or comments? You know, Pastor Mike, on that note, we as a church body need to be praying for the teachers in the schools. Absolutely. That they are teaching what is right. Because they are being infiltrated with wrong things now, even in the school system. They are. Going on to college and, their, and the whole society that's coming out of that is this perverse nation. They are. They are. And, and that's... And that is where it's starting. And you have so many teachers that aren't teaching. They're quick. They're, they're, not, they're not going in there. They don't have the backing. They don't have. So it's, it's, a critical, it's a critical time. But that's what Paul wanted the Ephesians to understand. It's a shame, so, that, Mike, it's a shame that we have to have the school system being the parent. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, that's. <clears throat> that's where it, I mean, I didn't have to have sex education in school. I right. taught that at home. Yeah. And you didn't, you know, you, you were taught what was right and wrong at home. Yeah. And now, a lot of kids, I know from my granddaughter going to school, they don't know right and wrong. Yeah. And then when the teacher steps in to try to correct that, the parent comes down. 
Yeah. Because they didn't do their job to start with. Yeah. And I think it tells you in this little book about the parents. It does. <laughs> it does. And, and the breakdown of the family mm -hmm. is the devil's greatest weapon. Mm -hmm. It is. It's a divide and conquer. And and that's that's how he operates. That, that's what he's he is in it to do. It is to break that apart. And he does it, he does it any way he can do it, using whoever he can use to do it. But yeah, it's a it's a trying, it's a trying time. But that's why he's got us. That's why he's got the church. As you will see it for prayer. And he's still got that light that Paul told these Ephesians. Be that light. Don't joke about the sin. Don't don't say things about it that you don't mean. It, it's got you got to stand with with what the word has to say on that. You, you have to and if you don't, you know, well, follow it if you want to, but if you don't, it's going to lead to destruction. Proverbs said there's a right that seems way to a man, but the end of it is death. The other thing about that too, Pastor Mike, the Lord just keeps bringing that burden on me is to tell people there's no way out. Once you once you choose to follow Satan and you die that way, there's no way out ever. Yeah. It's for eternity. It is. And that's it a is. it's a heavy thing, but they need to know that. There's no they way do. out. They do. And and that's why Paul was even on it. He said, Don't listen. Don't listen to that stuff. Don't listen to the deceptive words. Don't be drawn into that. Because as you know, he, he said uh, to Timothy, it tickles their ears. Or maybe James, I think it tickles their ears. And and that's what people are looking for. And it's pretty much always been whoever come up with it, misery loves company. I haven't found it in here, but you've probably heard people say misery loves company. Well, it, it's the fact that it seems like the more you have for something, the more right it seems. That because you will never find it. I mean, everybody. There will be no friends in hell. What's there that? There will be no friends in hell. There will be. There will be. Yeah, it's Send a, more animals. Send more animals. Yeah. <laughs> Send laborers <laughs> into the field, Lord. That's what you got to do. Send laborers into the field. I'm glad he still got his hand on this thing. I'm glad he still got it. He still got the church. Uh, Ruth Graham Bell had said one time, I don't know if she was quoting somebody else, but Ruth Graham Bell had said that God would have to apologize to America for, you know, or to Sodom and Gomorrah because he hasn't judged America. Well, I, I understand the concept of that, but God also said, if you can find me one righteous person in that place, I won't destroy it. That's the reason we're out destroyed. There's some righteous people in this place. There's a remnant. And that's why Peter said he's long suffering because his will is that none should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. That's why he hasn't judged it yet. But it's going to be judged. It's kind of so that's that's where it is. But I hope I hope you got something out of Paul's Ephesian teaching when he's talking about. He's talking about the change of the life. And, and I put it simply, you've heard me always say it this way. If the church looks like the world, the world has nothing to come to. I mean, if we don't offer something, then they have nowhere to go. Father, thank you tonight for these who come, and thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding us into this word and helping us to understand it. And thank you for guarding our hearts and guarding our minds and giving us that boldness to stay true to you in times like this. And I'm sure that I'm sure that probably people in Paul's day, Paul being one of them, I'm sure that some of the disciples and the apostles back in that day probably looked upon that society and saw it and probably thought, man, this is a hopeless cause. But they didn't quit. If they thought that, we don't know it because they didn't write it down for us. What they did write down for us is the fact that you've got your hand upon all humanity, 
and that by way of your church, you're able to reach other people. So I pray that we, as Paul told him, he tells us we're to walk in that love. And we can't do it on our own, but we can let you love people through us. So help us to see what it is you would have us to do as individuals to do our part. We pray and we, and we teach and we witness. And Lord, I know that you will guide us and lead us in the right way because all in all, we know that your will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's going to happen. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us and helping us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering us. In your name, Jesus, I say it all by faith. And his saints will say, we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 And amen. Pastor God, Mike, you, that really, yeah. Yeah. women's fellowship tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Women's fellowship meeting tomorrow, 2 o'clock. Where? Where was it going to be? <laughs> fellowship Hall? <laughs> fellowship Hall. All right. Women's fellowship, we'll leave in the fellowship hall. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>